I was uh, reminded that I hadn't introduced myself uh, when I first welcomed you. Uh, this is uh, the formal opportunity for, for me to speak. And uh, what I hope to do uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes is to set the scene for the interesting speculations and explorations that our panel is uh, going to embark on. Uh, when I approach them, together with Smriti, who will be our navigator for the exploration, uh, I told them to uh, stand on the shoulders of Sir Arthur and, and speculate about their respective, respective uh, areas of expertise. And uh, that's what I hope they'll do. But this is by way of setting context. Uh, and so for those who may not be so familiar with uh, Sir Arthur's vast body of work, I thought I will just uh, explain uh, the, the underlying thinking behind our conversation today. One is that the boy who was born 100 years ago tomorrow was a lifelong optimist. He remained young at heart all through his 90 orbits around the sun, as he called it. And he was always trying to look at the better side, even in the direst, most dark moments uh, both in personal life and in, in, in uh, national or global terms. And uh, that is something we hope is an essential or useful virtue for uh, heading into the future and exploring the future. Because there are many science fiction writers like Philip K. Dick who, who offer the dystopian views of our future. And then there is Arthur C. Clarke and a couple of other uh, accomplished writers who who take a more measured view. Uh, not exactly utopian, they acknowledge the problems, but they also see hope. Why Sri Lanka 2048? It all started in uh, 1997, exactly almost 20 years ago, with a phone call from a newspaper, The Sunday Observer, Prasad Abu Bakr, the then editor of the uh, Sunday Observer magazine section, had started a series of articles because Sri Lanka was uh, soon going to mark 50 years of uh, independence in early 1998. So beginning in late 97, the Sunday Observer every week asked an eminent person to think and reflect on challenges and prospects for the next 50 years. So when the invitation came to Sir Arthur, he suggested that he and I work on this together because he was working on a major book and he didn't really have too much time to spare. But he also saw this as an important opportunity to, to reflect on, on his adopted homeland. So we worked on a text uh, capturing some of his uh, reflections and, and imagination and picking on a couple of areas. So this was published in um, December 1997 and, and therefore, when uh, Sir Arthur's birth centenary comes up, we have passed 20 years since this publication, and Sri Lanka is going to soon, uh, next year, next February, going to mark the 70th anniversary of independence. Why not take the, the view for the next 30 years? And from the Clark birth centenary to Sri Lanka's independence centenary, hence the theme of our conversation being Sri Lanka 2048. So in this 1997 article, uh, taking the next 50 year view as it were from there, he looked at, uh, you know, what, what we need to do to make this a better country. Now, some of you may not even remember, you may be too young to remember how things stood back in the late or mid 1990s. Uh, so he outlined the vision. For example, how can development uh, be more equitable that he saw the need for the benefits of development to be shared uh, across all the entire population. The kind of vision that Sarvodaya has been advocating, uh, he fully subscribed to that. In fact, he was uh, a supporter of Sarvodaya all along. Uh, difficult though it is, he said, such development will have meaning only if it is socially and environmentally sound. Wise words which perhaps we haven't quite heeded in the last 20 years. Then, looking at uh, 
looking at the uh, couple of areas that particularly interested him, uh, and that also is one of the topics we'll explore in some detail later in this program. Uh, he talked about energy and the need for us to achieve a judicious and balanced mix of conventional and alternative sources of energy. Because everyone is entitled to using energy and how do we supply this in a, in a way that is affordable, clean and safe. Uh, so that again he, he shared uh, some thoughts. I'm just using extracts here. We will have the full uh, article Sri Lanka in 2048 on the website. On the future of telecommunications, there are some of his prophecies have already come true. He was talking back then when our telecom uh, coverage was rather limited about having uh, improved telecommunications uh, in all parts of the country. And that how that will affect and change the lifestyles of our people. Uh, this has happened to a large extent. Uh, with the benefits have come fresh challenges and problems, yes, but it, it's a sector that has developed and evolved very rapidly. He said also that internet will no longer be a luxury. His fear was that some might spend too much time uh, on the internet. Now, is that happening? The younger members of the audience might agree. Okay, so and then he, uh, he said that it is necessary not just to have better telecommunications, but also better communications among human beings. Now, that was one of the key points he uh, highlighted in that article. Now, we fast forward to 2005. So, the tsunami happened in December 2004, and then, uh, of course, Arthur was very deeply uh, concerned about the destruction and appealed for global help to Sri Lanka. And then um, early in 2005, Vijit Dichikera, who was then with LMD, the monthly business magazine, approached Arthur saying, we'd like to put you on the cover, we'd like to do a lengthy interview on looking at Sir Arthur's vision for this country and the world at large. So, he agreed, and this, in fact, turned out to be the last extensive, detailed media interview that Sir Arthur did for a print medium uh, outlet in Sri Lanka before he passed away in early 2008. So again, in this interview, uh, which we will make available in full uh, on the website, he returned to some of the points he uh, touched on, because here he had two, 3,000 words in which to speak his mind unlike 800 words uh, in a newspaper page, tabloid page. So he actually spoke his mind and said, reminded everyone that uh, he's still a guest on the island. He always was, never a citizen, only a resident guest. And therefore, he said he has to be careful in uh, how he uh, spoke about his host nation. Uh, but he said during the time that he has lived in Sri Lanka, which by then was approaching half a century, uh, he'd seen many good things happen, but sometimes also the country take wrong turns. Now, he didn't elaborate. There was no need to elaborate for a Sri Lankan readership. If we have, he said, if we have the humility to learn from past mistakes, the next half century can be far better than, far better than the last. And I can only hope that we learn these lessons quickly and apply them resolutely. Have we done that since 2005? I leave it to you to decide. Elsewhere in the interview, uh, talking about you know, the need to invest in the people uh, and, and in uh, developing the knowledge economy, uh, he, he had these views. Sri Lanka must export our uh, exploit. I beg your pardon. Sri Lanka must exploit our comparative advantages, such as the high literacy rate, and the technical dexterity of our people. The geographical location and also the medium size of our island are also other advantages he mentioned. Sri Lanka should not, Sri Lankans should not just work hard, but also work smart uh, in the global marketplace. We have to evolve our own business and technical models, he said. Then, 
this is the, the, the third and last extract from that interview I'll share today. Uh, now he takes a bigger picture. He always liked to take steps back and, and look at the, the bigger, the grander scheme of things. And there he has advice for all of us if we should not allow, and this, mind you, is when the war was still uh, going on, uh, the last stages of Elam War um, uh, were happening or beginning to happen. We should not allow the primitive forces of territoriality and aggression to rule our minds and shape our actions, he says. If we do, all our material progress and economic growth will amount to nothing. I have always been an optimist, and I still remain optimistic that Sri Lanka will achieve lasting peace. He never said peace, he always said lasting peace or durable peace. He always qualified it. So then, uh, again, have we achieved that? I uh, leave it to this house to, to uh, ponder about that. Coming on to 2007, December. This is the third example from uh, which I will uh, share a couple of extracts. It wasn't a piece of writing, but a nine minute video where he looked back at the 90 years or 90 orbits around the sun uh, on the eve of his 90th birthday, exactly 10 years ago, in December 2007. This is available and a highly viewed video on YouTube. Uh, now, having looked back at his own life and reflected on the times uh, that he's uh, seen and contributed to, uh, he said, Technology tools help us to gather and disseminate information, but we also need qualities like tolerance and compassion to achieve greater understanding be between peoples and nations. And then he went on to list three last wishes. He said as an individual, he had no remaining ambitions. He has seen far more than what he'd hoped to see as a young boy growing up in rural England. But at a bigger picture level, he had three last wishes. Firstly, he wanted to see no some evidence of extraterrestrial life, life outside the Earth. Uh, because he believed in the possibility, uh, but there has been no actual conclusive proof. Uh, but we are still waiting for the ETs to call us, he said. Uh, of course, there was no way of guessing how soon it could happen, and it still hasn't. So that's his first wish, which remains to be fulfilled. Secondly, and more relevant to uh, a topic of our conversation, today he wanted to see clean, affordable energy, energy sources developed, and to enable us to kick what he called the addiction to oil or fossil fuels. Climate change, he said, has now added a new sense of urgency, and our civilization depends on energy, yes, but we can't allow oil and coal to slowly bake our planet, he said. There, on the second wish, there has been significant progress since 2007, and we'll hear more about it from one of our speakers. Third and last wish was closer home. He said, these are his exact words, that he dearly wished to see lasting peace established in Sri Lanka as soon as possible. But he also said he's aware that peace cannot just be wished uh, it requires a great deal of hard work, courage, and persistence. Have we achieved that peace? So I'm going to, these are the, these are the, the context-setting remarks I want to offer you. Uh, another thing I want to, to remind is that uh, from the memories of these 17 individuals from different walks of life in Sri Lanka, you will find other facets and insights uh, of the man who was Arthur C. Clarke. So uh, please visit uh, at your leisure. And uh, we will soon be unveiling. We wanted to launch this today, but we are still beta testing, and there are a few bugs and glitches we need to fix. And in the spirit of Sir Arthur, who, who would always strive for perfection, I took an editorial decision uh, two days ago not to rush and have the website uh, with mistakes placed online today. But the, the YouTube videos are all online, 
and the website will soon join and we, we ask you to keep a lookout and watch this space and let me end or let me leave you with this thought and one of the things we are doing is in social media we are sharing the, the remarkable quotes of Sir Arthur uh, by going through his work, uh, published work and speeches and so on. Uh, so thank you for coming, can, thank you for joining this conversation. Finally, this is an experiment. If this works, we will hopefully have uh, this as a regular event, as an Arthur C. Clarke Future Forum. Uh, if it doesn't work, well, it'll be a good learning experience. Thank you very much. <laughs>